Shu drak to ki Shin she lop shir shak su so Guru Pama city. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, know of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be attained, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, Helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, Supreme One, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you, who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, Ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust, matchless one endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, Field of ocean-like merits and good qualities. To the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment. Through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms. Unique, supreme, ultimate meaning. To the dharma that brings peace I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path. Well abiding in the pure trainings. Holy field, endowed with good qualities. To the sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma Refuge, homage to the Great Sangha, to all three ever devout, homage. To all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, the Supreme Faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, Illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, May I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. 
I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen. And may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O my masters, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Idam Guru Ratna Mandalakam Tiyami. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on mass of Vultures Mountain on Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra. Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form, Emptiness is not other than form, form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no objects of touch and no phenomenon. There is no eye element and so on and up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on and up to and including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, Bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequal, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, Tayata, Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasam Gate, Bodhisoha, Tayata.
Tā ir tā gata, gata, pāra, gata, pāra, sam, gata, ebūti, suha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Shari Variputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Good. <clears throat> Uh, good morning. I'm wondering uh, if uh, uh, Kenshin Rinpoche has uh, uh, joined the meeting. Do we know? We don't know yet, so just... Doesn't look like he's listed. Okay. We, uh, we invited him to join today and also next week, but... Uh, he might be joining later, I hope, or uh, he had other responsibilities, or uh, he's having a good cup of tea somewhere, <laughs> so we like that. <clears throat> so today uh, I'm continuing the uh, discussion on the uh, 12 links of dependent arising. Uh, I went over those very briefly, um, and now uh, going into a little bit more depth uh, so we can uh, talk about the first link, ignorance. <clears throat> so in general, um, I want to say in general things, uh, why we're uh, studying this and uh, how the 12 links of dependent arising differ from uh, just talking about relativity or dependent arising in general. Because in the past, uh, we've used Lama Tsongkhapa's in praise of relativity to just talk about how since everything arises uh, independence, then it's uh, empty of inherent existence, empty of own being, empty of existing from its own side. And uh, that applies to like all phenomena, uh, including emptiness itself. But uh, when we're talking about the 12 links, uh, we're actually uh, talking about uh, uh, relative truth at this point. We're talking about how things appear. Right? We're talking about how there's birth and death and suffering and ignorance and grasping and so forth. So uh, this is uh, uh, relative truth. Uh, relative truth is uh, how things appear, uh, trying to describe our experience so that uh, when we look at our experience, uh, we can see the truth of our experience. Uh, so we ultimately want to see uh, the truth of uh, a radiant uh, and open awareness and see that as uh, uh, the ultimate truth, have that wisdom realizing emptiness. But um, uh, most of our lives uh, are the process of uh, relative or conventional truth. And as we'll study later in the Buddha Dharma program, um, there's uh, a way to establish uh, uh, some validity of conventional truth. So even though conventional truth may be imputed, according to the Madhyamakas, uh, uh, there's still uh, truth there and there's still uh, useful conventions, useful functions of uh, conventional truth. So uh, today we're going to say a little bit about these 12 links of dependent origination. The main reason um, the Buddha uh, talked this way is to describe the whole nature of uh, samsara the um, addictive cycle of, of suffering and screwed upness. <clears throat> and it's described and contemplated this way um, fundamentally at first to develop a sense of uh, renunciation or uh, literally in Tibetan definite emergence from samsara. So by contemplating the 12 links, we're contemplating how uh, the suffering comes about with the point of really wanting to overcome the suffering for both ourselves and others. 
So in Vajrayana Buddhism, uh, the main ways or traditional uh, Dharma too, the main ways of developing uh, distaste for samsara, the wish to be free, even the wish to develop uh, and be a Buddha for the sake of others is by either contemplating the Four Noble Truths or the 12 Madanas, the 12 links of dependent origination. Uh, probably people are more familiar with the Four Noble Truths than the 12 links. Um, and uh, maybe a reason for that, generally um, uh, the 12 links uh, are not talked about at first in one's Dharma study. Uh, it's encountered uh, uh, kind of in in the middle of one's long realm studies, so uh, I don't I don't know why it's positioned exactly that way. It's a little bit sophisticated because it goes into uh, the nature of clinging, grasping, and nature of mind and so forth. But uh, it has a very fundamental purpose that if we don't uh, really get uh, understanding of how uh, mess things how things are messed up, uh, we won't uh, fully want to emerge from that state and uh, wake up. <clears throat> so it, right now, in at least the United States and in, in the world, but particularly the uh, United States, like if there's anybody that doesn't uh, think that things are really messed up, uh, you really haven't been paying attention or living in a cave or under a rock. So um, we, uh, we can use the, um, the events of the last four years or <laughs> The last 200 years or 500 years to go, okay, this is really unsatisfactory. Um, I really have to do something about this. <clears throat> so uh, uh, one of the first things uh, that uh, we do is um, realize uh, actually that something's like terribly wrong. <clears throat> And uh, so that's why the Buddha said in the Four Noble Truths, like there's suffering, things things are bad. We acknowledge it. Uh, I understand. I I'm imagining still uh, there are people that uh, imagine that um, things are just fine in the United States, and that um, there wasn't an, an insurrection, an attempted coup d'état. Um, there are probably people still like, well, that was not a big deal. Um, I think it's a big deal when five people die and um, people continue to celebrate um, an insurrection. Um, so uh, I recognize that there's still uh, a lot of deluded beings, right? So uh, I'm, I'm going to participate in that suffering too, because even though I don't have that delusion that things are just fine and uh, we had a great president or something, uh, there's still the suffering of working with deluded beings, right? There's still going to be ongoing suffering. So um, just understanding that things are bad uh, or some sorry isn't enough. We, we have to understand how things came about. <clears throat> the Four Noble Truths uh, are very basic because uh, the Second Noble Truth says uh, the... Uh, cause of suffering is uh, sometimes just said uh, craving, or in Mahayana we'd say ignorant craving, or just ignorance, but uh, we have to break it down further and understand how we, we really create uh, a whole messed up world, not only for ourselves individually, but for others. So the 12 links is uh, uh, one uh, basic way that in uh, Buddhist idea we uh, talk about it. So um, I'm, I'm thinking out loud here, but I've been contemplating um, almost spending like <laughs> one month on each one uh, and, and drawing in uh, uh, our wisdom mind to examine uh, each link in the chain like that and um, to, see, uh, to see how that goes over. <clears throat> I'd like uh, to be a little scholarly and cite my sources. Um, of course, uh, hopefully as uh, meditation practitioners, uh, we're also using the source of our awareness, our intuition to see the truth of things. Um, but uh, we're not so arrogant to think that's enough. 
uh, we're also saying, uh, uh, we're interested in what other people are saying historically and presently. Uh, so uh, even uh, the greatest teachers, uh, Dalai Lama and Dujan Rinpoche that I've met, um, when asked to give a teaching, they'd say, um, yeah, I'd like to give a teaching on that. I have to um, study up a little bit. And uh, <laughs> I remember when Dujan uh, Rinpoche said that, I said, well, why do you have to study up? You know, don't you just have it all there? You know, and you just kind of pull it out of your mind, you know? But uh, this is someone with a lot of integrity, just like Dalai Lama, the Paramapa, or, or present teachers that you know, they're gonna study up, so. So uh, we reveal our sources and uh, where we work from. So uh, one of the reasons to doing this also is that if you wanna investigate further, then uh, you know I have some recommendations. So uh, one text that I mentioned early, um, I haven't mentioned yet, but it's called uh, How Karma Works by uh, Geshe uh, Sonam Rinchen, who was uh, a Lama that actually I met in Dharamsala. Uh, it's called How Karma Works and who's it by? Snow Lion. Um, this is a uh, transcription and translation of talks he gave at the Library of Tibetan Work and Archives. And the nice thing about the book is it, uh, contains uh, a commentary on Nagarjuna's uh, 26th chapter from the root verses. So people in the Buddha Dharma program should be thoroughly familiar with the 26th chapter, I'm sure. Just kidding a little bit. But uh, that's where he actually does talk, uh, Nagarjuna talks about uh, the 12 links uh, from his own uh, middle way perspective. <clears throat> uh, it's kind of a nice book because uh, it also, uh, for people that are really uh, trying to learn Tibetan, it has a Tibetan text too, right? Don't see that that much. Then um, also I want to consult uh, a teacher who's contemporary now in Australia. Some of you have uh, completed the foundations course when, you, when it was uh, through Jamyang in England, and that's a, a uh, text that I downloaded from Geshe Tasi Sering, um, just called The Twelve Lengths of Dependent Arising. And, um, that's about 40 or 50 pages uh, of ink. And uh, the other text that uh, a teacher I wanted to consult was also a contemporary teacher, elderly now, uh, Tonga Rimshe uh, from uh, Kamakagyu School. Um, Tonga Rinpoche, who I briefly met in Boulder, Colorado in like 1975. Um, uh, very, uh, one of the teachers of, main teachers in uh, Karma School, particularly of the Holiness uh, 17th Karmapa. So uh, I recommend that. Uh, nice translation by Ken Holmes, who uh, you could be Facebook friends with. I am, so maybe you could I want to be Facebook friends. I want to do that. Um, then uh, the other text I found useful uh, is the uh, text from Dzogchen Ponlop Rinpoche, um, who's a well-known teacher uh, uh, and has the Natartha Institute. Natartha uh, uh, means definitive teachings, definitive teachings. By a foundation, so uh, I think he has a, he's in Seattle, I'm not sure, something like that, and he gives online courses. So, and finally, um, this uh, uh, downloadable teaching uh, uh, from, uh, it's on the Lama Yeshe Wisdom Archive, but the teaching is from Geshe Rabton, who was um, an early teacher taught in Switzerland. What's interesting uh, for those who are scholars is um, these teachers are uh, saying very much the basic thing, but from slightly different points of view. So uh, scholarship doesn't mean you become all smart and, and know it all. It means you're willing to compare and contrast and hold together uh, different views. Isn't that so? Without mushing them all together or always uh, saying there just must be one right view and then after that, I'm not listening to anybody. So uh, 
at our uh, Dharma Center, uh, we're trying to promote uh, uh, real scholarship, whether you actually read the text or not, you're interested in like, well, what did other people say? And how does that contrast uh, or complement uh, some of my own thinking? And how can I dialogue with these people and dialogue with myself? So um, you may not go into as much detail uh, I might, but uh, I suggest uh, you know checking out some of these resources. Uh, the text I couldn't find, and maybe uh, somebody who's very um, has the time. Um, I might be able to find the book in our library, but uh, early, uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago, uh, Stephen Goodman, a scholar that recently passed away, who was working with Tartain Tolku in Berkeley, um, wrote an article that appeared in Crystal Mirror called uh, Situational Patterning. Situational Patterning was his translation of the 12 lengths of dependent origination. So uh, that was an interesting um, viewpoint uh, from uh, uh, Nyingma position. And uh, there, there, may be, uh, there may be some interesting translations that uh, Herbert Gunther gave from a long time ago. But uh, it's important to look at uh, different approaches. So uh, for example, Tonga Rimshe's approach is uh, going to look uh, through the lens of uh, he's talking to uh, excuse me, he's talking to Mahamudra practitioners, so uh, he's looking at the twelve links to uh, the highest yogic realization and still giving uh, an interesting talk. So uh, Zogchen Ponlaprimshe will also be giving an interesting perspective. So um, thank you for listening to that long scholarship, but um, it's important. Um, the, uh, the fascists uh, and domestic terrorists who are, are still attempting to overcome the government aren't interested in different points of view, right? They're not interested in uh, republic or democracy. They're not interested in hearing what other people have to say or giving people voices, right? So uh, we don't want, uh, or I'm not interested in uh, uh, fascist Buddhism either. <laughs> so uh, we, we want to have, uh, you know, uh, that diversity and the ability to uh, question and uh, debate and uh, move forward. Fundamentally, um, uh, Buddha Dharma is a tradition of peace. So, um, you know, there, there's different views and we could say, well, maybe we all agree on Four Noble Truths or Eightfold Path, and maybe we all agree that we should um, have some kind of ethical basis and be liberated. But what what's the overall uh, flow of Dharma? What's the overall um, tenor or temperament is uh, peacefulness. So uh, when checking out a tradition, tradition like Dharma, like I, I cannot imagine uh, uh, the Buddha or uh, Guru Himshe, Yeshe Sogyo, uh, present Dalai Lama, or present teachers advocating violence. Just can't imagine it, right? Now, I'm not saying there haven't been people in the past that, uh, or even in the present, in different countries, different traditions that have uh, stepped over that line. But as a tradition, um, as a, a flow uh, from everything we know from the time of the Buddha to uh, present day, uh, for people like uh, could, could people be advocating uh, harming sentient beings? Could people be advocating violence as a solution? I don't think so. They're, the only other, the only like other common thing that uh, is really very strong in Dharma is like, we're, we're not into sacrifice, okay? We don't sacrifice human beings and we don't sacrifice animals. So if you're in a ceremony where they're sacrificing an animal, you're, you're not doing a Buddhist sacrifice. Uh, ceremony. So, uh, you know, there, there are just some interesting things that I just can't believe being, uh, you know, part of a, a Dharma tradition. So, uh, you know, we, we all have perhaps friends and relatives that um, might be interested in what we're doing, might um, be 
thinking they're following a Dharma path, I'd have a really hard time understanding someone who's supporting those that advocate violence saying they're following a Dharma path. I just can't see it. Just, just can't see it. So um, uh, that's like my premise today. So uh, what we're trying to really emerge from uh, in Dharma uh, by studying the 12 links is we really want to emerge from a world where, uh, you know, violence and uh, taking over someone's territory, even internal, their internal territory, taking over their mind and thoughts is good. We just don't want to do violence. So the first part of Dharma is also uh, do no harm. Don't make it worse. Stop harming yourself. Stop harming your others. So that's the very first kind of test. You know, are we doing any Dharma practice at all? Uh, we, we really want to stop harming. We really want to definitely emerge from the idea that, uh, you know, really violence is, is a good lasting solution. So I, I want to stop here before I get into more, uh, detail and see if this is the topic that people want to, uh, explore. Uh, so we can open up a bit for like discussion, if you like, for a minute. So, uh, I'm open to rants, but keep them short. <laughs> okay. Lama, I would really love to hear a detailed explanation. Yeah, you actually muted yourself a little bit. So, oops, sorry. 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 Yeah, okay. uh, so, one month per link would make me happy. <laughs> Okay. And All right. uh, I did have a question about your introductory statements. Um, sure. Do you think that this uh, this this reality that these twelve links keep us uh, wrapped up in can be fixed by you know political action or by economic action? Or do we need to, in order to, uh, in order to have this work for us, do we need to actually focus on bodhicitta and uh, 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 attaining an awakened mind? That's really my question. Okay, good. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, uh, in the Vajana Tantric approach, we actually have to do it all. So, uh, one definition of Tantra. Um, as totality, uh, you know, when you say Dzogchen, we say great completion, like it, all of it, we have to do all of it. So um, we do have to, you know, create necessary causes and conditions and environments. And we also on the outer world, and we also have to create that on the inner world. So uh, looking at the history of this Buddhist, uh, Buddhist time, he, he spent a lot of time uh, talking to uh, political figures, you know, talking to kings and talking to uh, tribal elders. He spent time in trying to adjudicate uh, uh, wars and skirmishes. Um, so uh, he wasn't existing in a, a separate monastery. He, you know, they had retreat things in bamboo forests and then he'd walk into town. So. He was constantly interacting and uh, working with human relationships. Uh, it's really um, easier to do Dharma uh, in an open society, in a society that um, gives enough um, economic security and food to people that's nonviolent, because you have to be an extremely advanced practitioner to be able to uh, continue when your health is bad when you're under uh, political pressure, when you're having to take care of others when they're wartime situations. Uh, you know, of course they can be uh, reflections and inspirations for practice, but uh, things are bad enough, always even if things are going well, uh, there's enough pain, uncomfortableness, sorrow that we don't have to create anymore. So uh, it is absolutely necessary uh, to have uh, enough leisure time to practice enough health and enough safety. So there are political systems and economic systems that uh, are better for uh, liberation and just better in general like that. So um, 
one of the books that uh, I brought with me today, um, which puts together a lot of uh, material, um, uh, actually published like 20 years ago called Buddhist Peacework. So a number of different articles by uh, major teachers, um, creating cultures of peace. Um, I may have shared that I was uh, deeply involved in the Buddhist Peace Fellowship for a long time. And um, uh, would like to do more peace work like that. So uh, getting back to the, what I was saying, uh, tantrikas particularly have to do it all. We, we do have to do the inner work. We have to do the meditation work and eradicate the hatred and ignorance from our own minds. But then we have to create cause and conditions on the outside world uh, to make it possible. So I like that. I don't know, is that helpful or maybe? Uh, it, it is, but I, but you know, your, your, your example confuses me further actually, because, because Buddha, uh, when he was doing the adjudication and when he was talking to Kings, he was already enlightened. So during the period when he was seeking enlightenment, he, he, he wasn't adjudicating or talking to kings. He was living a life first as an, as an ascetic. Um, and even then, after, the, after that, for quite a while, he, he, he really was just teaching. So I don't know. It, it seems like I often feel that there's an overfocus on the external world uh, just by the nature of our very existence in this world already. And that uh, I, I, this is my struggle. I mean, I, I yeah. actually think, I actually believe that that I am more effective focusing on eradicating the hatred from myself than I am on trying to change anything in the external world because I'm a mess. I mean, I'm you know, I, it, it's always coming up on me. I'm ready to go to war all the time. Uh, I, I'm, I'm I drop of the hat. Let's go. I'm, I'm not not that I actually will pick up a weapon and use it on anyone or anything like that, but I'm I'm ready to verbally spar any time, you know. <laughs> and it would be good if I could back off from that more than I have. I've backed off it a great deal. If you knew me when I was younger, you would really like you'd go, "What do you mean? You're totally mellow now." <laughs> but but I'm not, you know. So I'm sorry to to belabor the point, but it's a really no. This is a good point that. Um... Uh, we do have to do a lot of retreat and the necessity for retreat and withdraw is important. And the Buddha did uh, have to like, okay, for 29 years, he was being prince administrator. I mean, he did a lot of administrative things. And then for uh, six years, he was on like strict retreat, basically, right? Teaching and living in the forest. And then he started interacting. So um, we have to do uh, long retreats, actually, we have to do our daily training and daily practice, and um, more is better, because for the most part, uh, we do, before we uh, actively engage, uh, we have to, you know, like, uh, go inside and, and not, uh, you know, spew more hatred. So uh, I, was, I was more of a Beatles person than a Rolling Stones person, so... I was like, you know, the song Revolution, you know, we first have to, uh, you know, uh, change inside. If you want money for people that hate, count me out, right? So um, <clears throat> the thing is, that's why we need Sangha. So while some of us are on retreat or doing internal work or scholarship, others can be, uh, you know, doing the outer work. And then when they need to do more inner work, then we'll we'll do the outer work, see? So you build up a group of friends, uh, just the Buddha course had a group of friends he was meditating with so that, um, you know, we can alternate like that. So it is possible to totally be uh, kind of partake of Buddha and uh, totally do it on our own uh, in a sense, but actually um, to create enlightened society, uh, uh, you know, we, we need a group of people. so. You know, some people are going into town and dealing with town and coming back, and some people are on retreat, and then we alternate. Uh, but in our own lives, uh, 
it's hard to do uh, everything all at once. Sometimes we have to alternate and um, you know go and retreat for extended periods of time, and then and then come out and then go back in again, like that. Uh, we we can't just do it all on the outside. Um, you know, we have to we have to do the inner work too. Um, so traditionally in Asia, if people said I want to be a full time uh, kind of hermit contemplative, actually these people are seen as part of society too and as helping out. They're not totally seen as like not benefiting. They are benefiting uh, society too. So there is there is a bias actually, of course, to doing contemplative work uh, in Dharma, and it's not just a social uh, uh, program. So um, it's it's going to redirect us to uh, uh, you know go to the essential truths. But generally, we're going to start with the relative. So we say, I um, you know I want to be free as a man. Uh, we ultimately want, want to say also, I just want to be free. So there's so much identity politics now, right? So this people's identity has been squashed, but we don't want to stop there. Otherwise, we wouldn't go also to the deeper truths. What do you think? <clears throat> Thank you, Lama. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Yeah, let's talk more, though. Okay, hi. Marie's on. Hi, Lamala. Hi. Um, thank you, because that actually answered some questions I had. So thank you, Dirk, and, and thank you, Lama. And yes, uh, I think one a month for 12 months would be a really good thorough pace. And, you know, I think we're in for a long haul. You know, things aren't going to change on the 21st. And I think, you know, you always say that this is, you know, Kala Chakra is about governance and, and how do you administrate Shambhala, you know, how how do you run things so that they're fair and just and peaceful and compassionate? So I, I think taking our time with this would be really valuable. Okay. So thank you for. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll do it. <laughs> Maybe maybe one more person to say yes, then three times, then I'll do it. <clears throat> but uh, would anybody else like to join uh, in on discussion before I say some uh, technical things about uh, ignorance? So. Well, I'd like to point out that Roberto uh, made a comment in favor of it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. If someone types in things, I can't see them because it's too small. So, uh, you know, one of my monitor people will have to be uh, letting me know I can't see it. So someone over on this side is actually going to have to speak up because uh, I won't be able to see it. If you're listening, those are looking at the computer, you're going to have to say, oh, this person said me too. Or something. Zach had an interesting uh, Ashley said me too. OK, good. And Jack said, I've noticed that a lot of my anger and despair around political situations mm -hmm. revolves around self-doubt and lack of creativity. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> so I'll, I'm going to say a few more things about the first link. Um, <clears throat> but uh, an overview is that um, the, the kind of task of uh, us as bodhisattvas is to tell the truth how uh, crazy or shitty things are while at the same time saying there's a way out saying that uh, it's not hopeless there's, uh, there's uh, uh, Buddha nature there's uh, indestructible goodness uh, there's a way out so uh, having the ba right balance or the middle way where people are motivated enough to leave a burning house without uh, and uh, see some hope in the practice and some release and freedom that happiness and freedom and well-being is possible is important. So it's a big task to to paint a realistic picture that helps us emerge from uh, hatred and delusion and greed uh, 
and but that doesn't discourage us. So we're proclaiming uh, essential goodness and essential screwed upness at the same time. Because <clears throat> if there's too much emphasis on on things are fine and nothing needs to be done and everything is perfect as it is, then we'll end up as uh, just long life devas, and uh, that good karma will eventually uh, out anyway. Uh, and perhaps some of us who have been having comfortable time uh, over the last 10, 15 years, maybe we maybe we got a little complacent and thought, oh, the, the problems or the crazies uh, are really gone, they'll go away. So uh, we have to have enough adrenaline not to be uh, freaked out uh, uh, and uh, actually do something. So the ignorance we're talking about here is a uh, fundamental uh, misperception of how things actually are. So when we say ignorance in the 12 links, we're not talking about uh, uh, just not knowing uh, how to build a website or knowing how to fix our car or um, uh, you know how things are going to turn out in five years. The ignorance is a specific ignorance, ignorance of uh, knowing, not knowing how things are and also knowing something in the wrong way. So uh, someone like Bob Thurman has translated that as misknowledge. We're not seeing emptiness and we're grasping at uh, the wrong thing, grasping at a self-existent, um, permanently existent, unchanging uh, identity at the same time. So the ignorance or marigpa or avidya in Sanskrit, marigpa in uh, Tibetan, uh, points to the fact that we were misperceiving uh, an object, we're taking a relative self to be absolute, uh, and uh, we, we don't know that we're doing it. So if even uh, Buddhas, uh, you know, don't always know how to uh, predict the future uh, uh, or know how to, you know, fix their car like that. <clears throat> So many of the truths, uh, many of the practical things, uh, like uh, language, for example, uh, have to be uh, learned. Of course, in some of the texts, it said, uh, like Lotus Sutra, and even um, in the current text we're reading, the Tara Tantra Shastra, uh, the, the Buddha nature itself is um, said, uh, the Buddha knows every everybody's mind can speak any language and so forth. And here we're talking about a very uh, cosmic Buddha, not our own individual Buddha nature, because uh, in a large way, uh, uh, the mind uh, and the mind itself is uh, bigger than our individual self. But from an individual point of view, the ignorance we're talking about today is overcoming the uh, attachment or grasping at uh, our long identity like that. So I want to stop here and see if that's making sense. That shouldn't immediately make sense. <laughs> that's actually quite difficult to get that. <clears throat> Lama, Lama, this is Karen. I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, I'm not yeah. sure is exactly on what you were mm -hmm. saying, but I just am trying to realize that in these 12 links, I've always seen it as a cycle and for some reason, I had the thought that that as you're going around cycling around day in and day out or whatever through and cycling through all of these links, that at any point you could bounce yourself out, you know, by uh, becoming, um, um, you, know, you know, really understanding some point along that chain and being able to break that chain. But or or, or is it that we have to realize the entire 12 links in order to really <laughs> eradicate our suffering or, or can we find places to exit this cycle um, by, you know, becoming good at some of these links or do you have to really realize the whole thing? That's a really good question. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, that's the whole talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the, in, um, in Mahayana, uh, teachings, uh, great vehicle teachings, we're really going to focus in on ignorance, not understanding nature of self, 
not mm -hmm. understanding nature of phenomena, not understanding nature of mind, right? So we're, we're really going to go at, at that as a focal point. Uh, in foundational teachings, sometimes we call Hinayana, the, uh, the focal point is going to be, uh, of course, also in ignorance, but uh, one of the main focal points will be uh, eliminating the craving, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so going, going, starting there. Yes. Um, actually, uh, uh, my presentation uh, will be that if we're doing a, a full tantric practice, doing, uh, we're we're having to do it all. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we're having to deal with uh, uh, skandhas. We're having to deal with uh, old age, uh, birth, and death. We're having to uh, look into all of these. So. Uh, that's true in the text too. Sometimes they say, "Well, uh, if you if you're not born, you're not going to die." Right. So if you eliminate that link, you're not <laughs> going to be born in a lower realm or a higher realm. You know. So that's one of the goals in foundational Buddhism. If you want to say, "I don't want to uh, take rebirth," then uh, you're in a sense you're breaking. A link there, right? Yes. So, uh, sometimes um, people think that uh, by just working on awareness, just working on our intelligence, uh, the cravings and graspings and uh, stupid stuff we do will immediately decrease. Uh, those people that have had to work with uh, addictions or compulsions of any kind, which should be everybody, uh, should tell the truth that a lot of times uh, we have to deal directly with uh, the craving on the spot in a very concrete way, right? So uh, even having, you know, profound, maybe a profound understanding of the mind and emptiness, uh, uh, even then, uh, you know, we shouldn't have uh, too many potato chips in the cupboard, right? I see. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> uh, we have, we, we actually should be thinking we, we need to do it all, but the, the two primary ways we're, we're working with, uh, samsara, so to speak, are seeing how we, uh, impute a sense of self on, on the skandhas, on these, uh, changing phenomena. Uh, and then how that uh, uh, turns into a wanting to make something permanent that's impermanent. So it, it has a built-in sense of, I want to continue uh, things that are pleasurable and discontinue things that are painful and maintain things that are neutral. So inherently there's a dynamism in the mind. The mind is not, um, uh, without dynamism, this is just kind of a blank slate. We're not just watchers. Uh, the mind is active, and in, until in, uh, grasping is turned to uh, interest or spaciousness, uh, we can have a lot of insight. We uh, still screw things up badly. <laughs> so that's why I say no. You you have to do it all. You, you can't say well, I'll just. I'll go to the essential and the rest will just line up. If you go to the essential, then you know that um, you have to uh, uh, go through every room in the building and turn on the light. Right. Thank so, you. Uh, <laughs> you know, then at the end, you might, you know, then, then, you, then you might find, okay, there is one switch that turns them on all, but, uh, or that keeps them running. But um, you have to explore each each house, each house, each room. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So there's just been too many teachers, you know, that um, they've had profound powers and uh, profound uh, meditative states, but then uh, they create more confusion, right? You know, so that's why um, say sometimes we're not paying attention to the the details of our lives, thinking that just uh, deep awareness overcomes it.
Mm, it's noon, so okay. Yeah. James has a hi James. Morning Ron. Thank hi. you for thought provoking talk and uh for all the comments, Dirk and Karen. Um my comment kind of dovetails in with Dirk's comment. Um, I used to be extremely political, uh, very active, and some of the things that I helped create, um, I, I wasn't happy with after they were created. So I went into a, a period of reflection for most of the last 20 years. And um, it does seem like confusion reigns supreme and delusion and misinformation and it seems like oftentimes our motivations to do something political are because we're impacted somehow specifically or we're motivated but we don't really want it in our backyard or something like that and it seems difficult to have movements that are really conscientious and are well thought through not just in legislation but in the application the funding the development and all those sort of things I, I know in our social work program when we did policy we focused on the homeless uh policy that was rolled out in sacramento but it wasn't one key piece of it wasn't funded and and in the documents itself it said this won't be successful unless this part is funded and i just kind of scratched my head and went <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> um, although I think we have been really successful, I think that needs to be a federal movement for a lot of reasons, which I won't get into here. But I was wondering, as as we're going through and you're encouraging us to be more politically active, what what can we do to help eliminate or reduce the confusion, the ignorance that abounds prior to actually getting out and starting starting to make some noise about something, starting to talk to our leaders, starting to rally for things? Well, uh, you know, like it or not, we're, we're in, you know, this society, so we're automatically part of the polis, the city. So whether we're silent or not, we're, we're in it, right? So no matter, you know, we're, if we're driving on the right-hand side of the road, uh, we're obeying the law, therefore we're political, right? We're a citizen of the polis. So um, it's it's using a wisdom mind skillfully to see, you know, what what is my level of involvement and what, you know, where I can maintain my sanity and balance and be effective. So am I able to do activities and communicate people without using violence or threats of violence, you know, or getting even, you know, all these like these uh, you know, difficult things that, that screw things up. So uh, we always are participating, even if we're in a cave, because uh, we, we can't suddenly leave human society. So I understand uh, political in a big way, but when we're talking about like specific representatives and uh, changing policy, of course that does take a lot of balance and it does take things through. But um, in a general way, uh, we can say, you know, I'm just really not, uh, into violence as a way of doing things, right? So uh, the people that were climbing up the walls of the Capitol are carrying guns. They're into violence, right? So we can say, well, you know, that really isn't going to work. So uh, we may not know the details of every situation. Uh, we may not know every little uh, ethical cause and effect piece, but um, we have to still come out loud and clear for saying, you know what, child abuse does is never a good idea, right? We don't have to know the details of the situation. We can just say, that's never a good idea, right? Never a good idea. There's no like, so uh, hurting children or, you know, um, causing bruises, burning them, hitting them sexually. Is that ever good? No, that's never good. We don't have to like say, well, I'll back up from that until I figure out what enlightenment is, right? We, we can already say enough in a general way, uh, you know, just what we have now. We may not know exactly like, okay, this is the way uh, to feed homeless, this is the way to create more housing, but we can advocate for uh, a society that is able to, uh, as much as possible, take care of people that can't take care of themselves like that. But we have to do a lot of self-examination to see are, are we really coming from a place of, 
uh, anger and hatred. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh has uh, been a good example of this, you know, over the years. I mean, how to really do direct action work and um, motivate people in a good way. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I didn't mention them today, but uh, until now, but uh, we don't always have to know the details of how things are going to roll out to advocate for them. But we do want to be very noticing that, like, are we, what, what kind of mind and motivation are we bringing? Yeah. This is big, you know, so we'll, we'll move forward with this, yeah. Like meditation, people are uh, always saying, you know, what, um, what meditation should I do? And I say the best one is one you actually do. Okay, so uh, we can't always do like 20 different things, right? So, uh, you know, do something that, that really works that you can do. And if it's working, since you can tell, okay, you're developing more peace of mind, more effectiveness, more clarity, more compassion, then it's probably working. If you're becoming more grumpy, hateful, not practicing, not training, you know, screwing things up, uh, whatever you're doing probably isn't working <laughs> over the long period. Of course, in training and practice, we, we bring up our emotional conflicts and our problems, and we see them, but uh, we learn not to, as much as possible, to act them out. So if the meditations are, over a long period of time, making things worse, then uh, probably they're not good. But if they're correct, then do more. So if if we're actually learning how to do the inner work properly, um, uh, stick with the practice you really do and do more of it. So if you're doing 24 minutes uh, uh, during this time of crisis, uh, do like a half an hour <laughs> or do, you know, uh, 30, 30 minutes, you know, do 30 minutes, right? When there's a crisis, you sh we should do, be doing more inner work because it's more easy to get um, called out, right? What do you think? Do you think we should do more inner work when, when there's a, a social crisis? I do. So I don't, you know, for, as you know, people with responsibilities, it's always going to be, well, you're either going to get up earlier or go to bed later or take a longer lunch. You're going to take some kind of break because there's no time stretch machine. <laughs> you know, maybe maybe we're all on the same page here. That would be really nice because when there's silence, that means the teacher is making sense and everyone agrees, right? So in our tradition, if you have a debate or a disagreement, you have to speak up. It, um, if you don't speak up in um, our tradition, then uh, that means assent. So then you have to go along with it, right? You can't be uh, you can't be doing this like I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> I don't agree, but I'm not going to say anything. So that you know, that's not the role. You, if you, you oh, Lama, it's Morris. Um, Hi. In, I've always been sort of overwhelmed by the by the twelve links. They seem inescapable. We can't, you know, on one level, we can't really escape them, can we? Uh, yes, we do. Is there a certain point of attack, um, or, um, uh, or we'll learn we'll learn that in time. Well, the 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 two big points of attack are uh, the craving, right, and the ignorance. So we really have ignorant craving. We we want we want things more of things. Uh, but we don't understand really what the things we want are. We usually okay. want impermanent things to be permanent, uh, and we want permanent things to be impermanent. We're we're totally upside down. Yeah, so we just need to kind of do this. But lots mm. of times, you know, we we become aware of our suffering through specific behaviors. So we're, we're contemplating all of our lives, uh, you know, through these metaphors, through these, uh, you know, 12 links. 
So it isn't just, we're just looking at ignorance, we're just looking at an, in an abstract philosophic way. We, uh, as meditations, uh, we're not just looking at birth and death and uh, consciousness and different things. We're, we're actually doing uh, narrative meditations on, uh, also. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think like a lot of people, I've been very much uh, taken up by events of recent days. And, yeah. uh, you know, this expression, doom scrolling, um, okay. <laughs> where you're, where you're, when, when one is on the, uh, yeah. uh, the internet and, and, and looking for, you know, more and more stories to that, yeah. that, uh, that are in, increasingly, and speculation is increasingly upsetting. And, and I find that this is, um, um, takes me further and further from, from, uh, refuge. Okay. That's, that's called craving and grasping. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's a craving. You know, so it isn't just craving for pleasurable things. We also crave uh, unpleasurable things in a weird way, right? So well, that, it's like there's a sore, like like an animal or a person has a, has a sore, and we compulsively yeah. scratch or pick at that sore and make it and worsen it. Yeah. So, um, you know, like uh, that's where we uh, think of cessation. You just want to, you have to stop it. Yeah. <laughs> That's a zero step, you know, just say, this shit has to stop. This isn't, this isn't leading the right result. So there's, there's a recognition that we're harming ourselves through overindulgence and, and, you know, trauma, you're re-traumatizing yourself, right? So yeah, uh, I got to stop this. So it may have to be very practical, like, okay, I'm not going to watch the news for a week or a day. Believe me, you'll find out the news. Someone will call you and say, here's the news. Thank you, Lama. Yeah. Good. <laughs> la, la, la. Where is she? Is he going to come on? Oh, hi. Happy birthday, a day late. Happy birthday. Thank you, Lama. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I have probably a silly question, but it's really important to me. Okay. This renunciation. And yeah. does that mean that I have to give up chocolate cake? Yes. Oh. For you, it does. <laughs> <laughs> You're hoping I'd say no, no. If you gain a wisdom mind, you can eat chocolate. I don't know. It depends upon how much, you know, like, like, are you, like, are you eating the whole cake and you can't stop? No, but I think about it. Occasionally, I think about when I'm meditating, I think about food. And it's sort of like, it's there all the time. So when you were talking, I was thinking, my God, yeah. that mean, I have to give up chocolate cake. I mean, I'm not probably, probably if you're thinking about food, then you'd have to give up food. <laughs> Just kidding. So uh, that's where we have to distinguish. Is this just uh, like in Chamata, a craving for excitement? We're kind of bored. So we start thinking about it would be interesting to have, you know, just some sense, some taste, right? This happens a lot in meditation. We're developing concentration and we're hitting our boredom layer. layer. Boredom is actually a form of anger, right? We don't want to be experiencing what's going on. So we're, we're, then we start going after excitement. So what are the antidotes to excitement and shamatha? Uh, uh, sinking or grounding? Grounding? No, not, well, not you don't want to do sinking because that's that's another out of balance thing. So, but you, you might have to contemplate like even, it might be a narrative contemplation. You might think, you know, you, even when I eat my chocolate cake or have my favorite food, it's really gone really quickly. And it doesn't bring lasting happiness. We should tell the truth. It brings some happiness for a second, but then it doesn't last. And is this the kind of, is this what we want? No, we, we want some lasting freedom and happiness. So we actually do that. Or you could just, you know, do more like charnel ground kind of meditation. You can, you know, visualize like, um, you know, worms coming out of the chocolate like that. You know? Or the chocolate turning to caca. 
that's that, that's traditional. It's very traditional to do these kind of uh, horrible meditations to overcome sensual desire. That might be the way you roll. I don't know. Or you might just have, you just might notice, okay, craving, you're just labeling it in kind of Abhidharma way. Okay, craving, and then then you're just back. Because sometimes, uh, when I say Abhidharma, Abhidharma is much into classifying and labeling. There's a lot of power in the mind. So sometimes just acknowledging it, craving, you're not making a sentence about it. Oh yeah, then then you're, you know, you're just kind of, uh, you know, poking a little bit with a pen and taking the air out of it. And then you're just going back to your meditation object. So many entertainments and distractions actually don't have so much power, uh, but we have to take out our little pin of mindfulness and go like, like that. Or you, you know, if you want, you know, it's, you you can cope. You can say, well, I've got another two hours on my shama to hear, but then I get to have the chocolate cake. Or you know, like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of traditional, you know, small scope, right? Small scope, and you know, means I'm practicing Dharma in order to have a more satisfying life. And most of us, myself included, are, you know, I'm my mind is in small scope most of the time. I just want some comfort, right? There's nothing wrong with that. It's just acknowledging it. Say, you know, I, I just want to have a good meal. I'm sitting here, it's 10 o'clock, and I'm just thinking about how great lunch will be. Anybody that's done long retreats, as a few people here have, know that a large portion of your meditation time in long retreats is taken up wondering what the meal's gonna be like. Isn't that so? Who's done long retreats? It's so true, isn't it? You know, even though the, the meal might just be like rice and tofu for like the 10th, 11th, 30th time, right? It's the same crazy meal, you know, and and you're hoping it'll be really exciting this time. And it's nice to eat, but then it's not. It's kind of, then you're eating like this fast and it's over. But you spent like the last two hours thinking about how great lunch will be, right? <laughs> what do you think? What do you think, Elizabeth? Uh, I think those are good ideas. Uh, yeah. And chocolate cake never lasts very long. It really, unless you really focus on the taste the whole time, which is hard to do. It goes away when you take a bite. In fact, it's better in your mind than it is in actuality <laughs> in some ways. Of course, you know, like uh, uh, if we're very, you know, uh, dedicated practitioner, have a lot of strong uh, uh, background in Dharma, we can, you know, able to take tantric approach, you know, so the, uh, the bliss that's generated from the chocolate is used energy to realize nature of mind, right? So that tantric approach is possible um, uh, unless we've done the Hinayana and Mahayana foundations, it's very easy to kind of uh, just turn it into, uh, I get my cake and eat it too kind of thing, right? So uh, uh, developing the bliss states based on um, our regular sensual pleasures is part of Tantra, but unless there's a, a, some kind of Vipassana, some kind of insight into the nature of mind, um, generally the sense pleasures will, will overcome, uh, you know, one's mind, right? But, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you're uh, becoming a Tantrika, you know? <laughs> you, want, you want the bliss of the cake without the karmic repercussions, you know? <laughs> no, there's always karmic reproduction. There's, I'm just joking. That actually, this always karmic, uh, you know, uh, results, right? So Padmasambhava, uh, you should know the quote. You know, my mind is as vast as the sky. My activity is as, um, you know, fine as barley flour. Like that. Yeah, so we're almost coming. So, yeah, it's been a very good turnout today with good comments. Um, I hope this has been helpful for everyone. Um, 
you know, I, uh, I think all of us can do something, dialogue with friends and neighbors. Uh, we can post things on Facebook, but uh, at least we can make the lines or we can tell the truth as best we know it, right? So uh, uh, we might be confused about actually how things would play out, but we can advocate for some sanity and peace, don't you think? It's possible. <laughs> like that. Maybe it's time to say goodbye. I appreciate everyone um, dialing in. I'll be talking to Kenshin Rimshay because I, I do appreciate his uh, perspective and uh, advice and friendship. So um, like that, uh, if people want, if people didn't write down some of the resources I mentioned, uh, you can email me and uh, I'll get those to you, okay? These talks are meant to be uh, fairly general, and um, they're meant to be, from my side, they're meant to be for people that are doing the inner work, doing the meditation and yogas, and doing the activity uh, practice during the day, so that it's not meant to spoon food you, it's meant to provide some structure so you know where to look, right? I like that. <laughs> So, okay, so Susan, do you want to, should we do a dedication? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Lama. Yeah. And I've got to tell you, I've got a visual now of worms coming out of chocolate cake that is just not going to leave me for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Dedication prayers. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rezig, Kenzen Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, a great treasure of objectless compassion. Manzushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Nankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losangdrapa, make requests at your holy feet. So uh, I'd like to you know, as we say goodbye to, uh, thanks Susan for being Omze today and for um, continuing the course on uh, the Bodhisattva way. And uh, thank Dirk for doing Phase of the Moon and Manjushri and Vajra Sattva. Uh, and give a shout out to um, uh, Mindful Recovery, um, which is um, uh, the longest running program that Lions Roar has done. Um, uh, so, uh, I was telling, um, Annette that I, I want to, you know, attend at least, uh, one, uh, mindful recovery, uh, session a month. So, uh, I may make, uh, some Sunday morning, uh, interviews a little shorter, but, uh, that's, uh, you know, my aspiration like that. That's important. <clears throat> So I wish you uh, all good health and fun. And, um, you know, it, if if you like chocolate cake and you don't have a problem with it, you could visualize chocolate cake emitting uh, a bright light of wisdom awareness, sending out uh, bliss and love and peace to all beings from uh, this uh, Dharmata chocolate cake. <laughs> like that, okay? 
So uh, we do need to enjoy our lives. So I think the best though is to be, you know, happy helpers, right? So uh, even though we suffer because others suffer, we, we can share our happiness and freedom with others too. And that helps like that. Um, Morris has an announcement. I don't, maybe it's disappeared. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Peace to all worms. Yeah, like Aww. worms can taste good, you know, so I like that. All right. I'm a home. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Bye. Bye.